Watching the English newscast on Future Television, I'm Linda Tamim, and these are today's top stories. Saudi Arabia says it has executed 47 terrorists, including Shia cleric Mehmed Mehmed and Al Qaeda affiliated Faris Zahlani. Snow continues to cover Lebanon for a second day as Storm Vladimir persists in the country. Several roads remain blocked. The Saudi-led coalition battling Houthi rebels in Yemen announces the end of a ceasefire that had been violated on a daily basis since it was declared last month. Saudi Arabia has executed 47 people convicted of terrorism, including prominent Shiite cleric Nimr and Nimr. The 56-year-old cleric was a driving force of the protests that broke out in 2011 in the Sunni-ruled kingdoms east, where the Shiite minority complains of marginalization. The list also includes Sunnis convicted of involvement in Al-Qaeda attacks, which killed Saudis and foreigners in the kingdom in 2003 and 2004. Yuna Nafal has the developments. A prominent Saudi Shia cleric, Sheikh Nimr al Nimr, was executed with 47 other people for terrorism. In an apparent message to both Sunni Muslim jihadists and Shia anti-government protesters that the conservative Islamic kingdom will brook no violent dissent. Nimr and six other Saudi Shias, including Nimr's nephew Ali, were sentenced to die and to have their bodies publicly displayed, the most severe penalty available to judges in the strict Sunni majority kingdom. The execution of Nimr is expected to inflame already raging sectarian tensions in the Middle East. Iran's foreign ministry spokesman accused Saudi Arabia of supporting terrorism and executing its opponents while Ayatollah Ahmad Khatami, one of the most senior clerics in Shia, ruled Iran, said in an interview with the Meher News Agency that Nimr's execution reflected the criminal nature of the Saudi ruling family. The brother of the cleric, Muhammad al Nimr, said the family was shocked by news of his brother's execution but hoped that any reaction would be peaceful. But in Bahrain, demonstrators carrying pictures of the cleric already faced security forces in a standoff in the Shia Muslim village of Abu Saiba, west of the capital, Manama. Analysts say Nimr had long been regarded as the most vocal Shia leader in the eastern province district of Katif, willing to publicly criticize the Al Saud ruling family and call directly for elections but he was careful to avoid calling for violence. Hezbollah condemned Arabia's execution of Nimr and Nimr, holding the United States responsible for the development. It said in a statement that they hold the U.S. and its allies who are presenting direct protection to the Saudi regime, responsible for covering up the kingdom's crimes against its people and those of the region. It also added that this crime will remain a black mark that will plague the Saudi regime that has been committing massacres since its inception. Nimr's execution also drew condemnations from the Higher Islamic Shia Council, the Amal Movement, Iran, and Iraq. Separately, a prominent cleric with close links to Iran's ruling establishment denounced Nimr's execution and predicted the repercussions would bring down the Saudi ruling family. Yemen's Houthi movement mourned Nimr as well as a holy warrior. Saudi Arabia and a mostly Gulf Arab alliance has been bombing the Houthis for nine months after the group, which hails from a Shia sect based near Yemen's Saudi border, made an armed push in March against the embattled Yemeni government. The Houthis say they are leading an Islamic-inspired revolution against corruption, but the kingdom fears the group is a proxy for its Shia arch-rival Iran. Deputy head of the High Islamic Shiite Council, Abdel Amir Kamalan, has described the execution of Sheikh Nimr and Nimr as a major mistake that could have been avoided. In a statement issued after Riyadh announced the execution of Nimr and the 47 prisoners, Abalan said a royal pardon would have eased the sectarian and religious tension storming the Arab region. The execution of Sheikh Nimr is an execution of reason, moderation, dialogue, and the opinion of others, he said calling it a reckless act and a dangerous precedent for further extermination of Islamic unity and its pioneers. He lamented the unjust sentence that turned Sheikh Nimr into a witness of discrimination and a martyr in confronting it. Abalan warned it was a crime against humanity that will have serious repercussions in the coming days. 
Lebanon's Grand Shiite Mufti Sheikh Ahmad Abalan echoed this statement, saying the move was a call for a division. Now for some news in Lebanon. Snow continued to cover the country for a second day as Storm Vladimir persisted. Several roads remain blocked before motorist slopes prepare to launch the ski season. The weather is expected to improve starting tonight as the storm coming in from Russia subsides off the eastern basin of the Mediterranean. Reports say temperatures will start to rise overnight with rain and strong winds set to intensify before easing on Sunday. Snowfall, however, is expected to continue at altitudes of 1,000 meters and above. Thick layers of snow buried areas in northern Lebanon blocking roads and making it difficult for people to move about. People were advised to stay indoors. At least two people are killed in a bomb attack in the Somali capital. More details coming up next. Welcome back. You're watching the English News live on Future Television. Israeli security forces have pressed a manhunt for the gunman who killed two people and wounded seven others at a Tel Aviv pub. As the motive for the attack remains unclear, the New Year's Day shooting on busy Dizengoff Street came amid a wave of Palestinian attacks on Israelis and days after the leader of the ISIS group threatened the Jewish state with violence. Security camera footage shows a gunman moments before the attack. The footage showed the assailant, who appeared to be in his mid to late 20s and wore protective eyeglasses and a windbreaker, browsing dried fruit at a health food store in, on, on Dizendorf Street. He then pulled a machine pistol from his backpack and stepped onto the pavement, shooting wildly. At least three people were also wounded in the attack. With the suspect still at large, police declined to offer any motive. A Saudi-led coalition battling Iran-backed rebels in Yemen has announced the end of a ceasefire that has been violated on a daily basis since it was declared last month. The Saudi press agency says the ceasefire announced on December 15th had been ended due to continuous rebel attacks on the kingdom's territories by firing ballistic missiles towards Saudi cities, targeting Saudi border posts, and hampering aid operations. The coalition, moreover, said rebels continued to shell residents and kill and detain Yemeni civilians in cities under their control. However, the coalition said it was still eager to create the sustainable circumstances to find a peaceful solution in Yemen. And still in the region, the UN says at least 980 Iraqis have lost their lives in violent attacks during the month of December 2015, around 90 more than November. The announcement comes amid an offensive by the Iraqi military to retake Ramadi, the capital of Anbar province. The UN assistance mission for Iraq, known as UNAMI, said in a statement that 506 of those killed in December were civilians, while the rest were security personnel, including Kurdish Peshmerga and paramilitary troops. The figures were released a day after 60 Iraqi government and allied fighters were killed in an attack by ISIS north of Ramadi. Moving on to Europe, a man rammed his car into four soldiers guarding a mosque in the southeast French city of Valence, but was stopped when a soldier fired and wounded him. His motives were unclear, but with France on high alert after the coordinated attacks in Paris on November 13th, determining what or who was behind the attack carried a sense of urgency. One soldier was slightly injured and a passerby was reportedly hit in the leg by a stray bullet. The man who was alone in the red car and not immediately identified was arrested and hospitalized. And in Africa, at least two people have been killed and two others injured when a suicide bomber blew himself up at a restaurant near the presidential palace in the Somali capital Mogadishu. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack that targeted the village restaurant, often frequented by journalists and government officials and which has previously been attacked by the Al-Shabaab armed group. A group of gunmen has attacked an Indian Air Force base in the northwestern state of Punjab, which borders Pakistan. Sporadic gunfire continued into the day, and helicopters flew as an operation continued to calm the base in Patankot, where four gunmen were killed in a shootout with security forces early this morning. At least three Indian soldiers have also been killed in the attack, which took place about 50 kilometers from the Pakistan border. There was no immediate, there was no immediate, there was no immediate claim, excuse me, for responsibility. 
U.S. President Barack Obama says he may bypass Congress in his bid to increase gun control in the final year of his presidency. In his weekly radio address on Friday, Obama said he will meet Attorney General Loretta Lynch on Monday to discuss what options he can take, saying his New Year's resolution was to move forward on tackling the U.S. epidemic of gun violence, in his words. Last month, we remembered the third anniversary of Newtown. This Friday, I'll be thinking about my friend Gabby Giffords, five years into her recovery from the shooting in Tucson. And all across America, survivors of gun violence and those who lost a child or a parent or a spouse to gun violence are forced to mark such awful anniversaries every single day. And yet, Congress still hasn't done anything to prevent what happened to them from happening to other families. Three years ago, a bipartisan common sense bill would have required background checks for virtually everyone who buys a gun. Keep in mind, this is a policy that is supported by some 90% of the American people. It was supported by a majority of NRA households. But the gun lobby mobilized against it, and the Senate blocked it. Since then, tens of thousands of our fellow Americans have been mowed down by gun violence. Tens of thousands. Each time we're told that Common sense reforms like background checks might not have stopped the last massacre or the one before that, so we shouldn't do anything. We know we can't stop every act of violence, but what if we tried to stop even one? What if Congress did something, anything, to protect our kids from gun violence? A few months ago, I directed my team at the White House to look into any new actions I can take to help reduce gun violence. And on Monday, I'll meet with our Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, to discuss our options because I get too many letters from parents and teachers and kids to sit around and do nothing. I get letters from responsible gun owners who grieve with us every time these tragedies happen, who share my belief that the Second Amendment guarantees a right to bear arms, and who share my belief we can protect that right while keeping an irresponsible, dangerous few from inflicting harm on a massive scale. So I know there are a bunch of us who care about this. If you are one of them, I need your help. Change, as always, is going to take all of us. The gun lobby is loud and well organized in its defense of effortlessly available guns for anyone. The rest of us are going to have to be just as passionate and well organized in our defense of our kids. That's the work of citizenship, to stand up and fight for the change that we seek. I hope you'll join me in making America safer for all of our children. Thanks, everybody. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a recap of the top stories. Saudi Arabia announces the execution of 47 terrorists, including Shia Barak Nimr Nimr and Al-Qaeda-affiliated Fadis Zahran. Snow continues to cover Lebanon for a second day as storm Vladimir persists in the country. Several roads remain blocked. And a Saudi-led coalition battling Houthi rebels in Yemen announces the end of a ceasefire that had been violated on a daily basis since it was declared last month. Those are your top stories for this Saturday. I'm Linda Tamim, and I wish you all a very happy new year.